Very excited about this program on our consciousness series. Uh, Dr. Tucker is the Bonner Lowry Professor of Psychiatry and Neurosci Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia, and he's the director of the UVA Division of Perceptual Studies. It's our honor to have him come and share this information with us tonight. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jim Tucker. Thank you, Chris, and, and thanks to the Bell Symposium for having me here, and thanks to all of you to uh, coming out to hear what I have to say. Um, so I'm going to tell you about 50 years of research involving cases from various parts of the world of, of young children who say that they remember a past life. And I will start with an example. Um, so one day we got a letter from a mom in Oklahoma who said that she and her husband were just ordinary folks. Uh, she worked in the county clerk's office. Her husband was a police officer. Um, but their little five-year-old, Ryan, for the last year had talked about a life in Hollywood. And he would cry and beg his mother to take him back home to Hollywood. So finally, to kind of help him process this, uh, she went to the public library and checked out a couple of books on Hollywood. And they were looking at them one day when <clears throat> they came to page with this picture from an old movie called Night After Night. And Ryan pointed to the second guy in the picture and said, hey, Mama, that's George. We did a picture together. And then he pointed to the one on the far right and said, and Mama, that's me. I found me. Now, the first person that he pointed to was George Raft, who was, was quite a well-known uh, actor back in his day. Um, but the second one he pointed to, the one that he said he had been, uh, was an extra with no lines in the movie. Uh, so Ryan's mom wrote to me to see if I could help uh, sort out who this fellow was. So I uh, visited the family and uh, met with Ryan and his parents. And then afterwards, his... Uh, Mom started emailing me sometimes on a daily basis with all the statements that Ryan was making about his past life. And, and he was describing quite a life that, frankly, I thought was a little unlikely for an extra with no lines in a movie. Um, eventually, with the help of a Hollywood archivist, we were able to determine who this fellow was. Now, what the archivist did was she went to the library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and she got all the materials about this movie night after night. And most of it had to do with the stars, but then she came across uh, this picture. And on the back of it was a caption. It said, what the well-dressed racketeer will wear. Marty Martin playing a racketeer in Paramount's Night After Night with George Raft and the other stars gives a demonstration of underworld sartorial excellence. Um, so then I watched the movie again to make sure that we had the right guy and, and later confirmed with Marty Martin's family that in fact that was who Ryan had pointed to. And even though I thought it was unlikely that an extra would, would have the kind of life that Ryan described, uh, it turned out that Marty Martin did. So Ryan said how he had danced on stage in New York. Well, Marty Martin danced on Broadway. And Ryan said that he then went to Hollywood and worked in the movies, which Marty Martin did, uh, mostly working on dancing in the movies. Ryan said that he then worked at an agency, and Marty Martin started a successful talent agency. Uh, Ryan said he saw the world from big boats and talked about going to Paris. Uh, Marty Martin and his wife went on the Queen Mary to Europe and, and visited Paris. Uh, Ryan said that he had a big house with a swimming pool, which uh, Marty Martin did. And, and Ryan said that the street address had the word rock or mount in it. And uh, Marty Martin lived on North Roxbury. Uh, Ryan also said one time that he didn't know why God would let you get to 61 and then make you come back again as a baby. Um, <clears throat> which is an interesting question. Um, so Marty Martin died in 1964 and his death certificate said that he was only 59 when he died. Uh, so it looked like that was one that, that Ryan was wrong about. 
Uh, but then Marty Martin's daughter and his stepson both said that actually he was 61, so I looked into it and found a passenger list, three census records, and two marriage listings that all gave ages that meant, in fact, Marty Martin was 61 when he died and not 59. So even though the death certificate had said 59, Ryan was correct when, when he said 61. Uh, now, I mentioned Marty Martin's daughter. Um, she was only eight when he died, uh, but I met with her and went over all of Ryan's statements. Uh, there was a lot about her father's life that she didn't know because she was so young when he died, including didn't know about one of his sisters. Uh, but between talking with her and, and the records that we were able to get, uh, we were able to eventually verify that over 50 of Ryan's statements matched with Marty Martin's life. And then we had a meeting when we, where we had Ryan meet Marty Martin's daughter, uh, who of course is now um, solidly middle-aged. And uh, I have to say it was quite an awkward meeting. Ryan seemed rather overwhelmed by the whole thing. Uh, but then afterwards he enjoyed going to the building where uh, Marty Martin's uh, talent agency had been. And then after that trip, he started wearing what he called his agent glasses. If, if you notice the pictures of Marty Martin when he was older, he had these thick black uh, frames for his glasses. And Ryan got some glasses. I think these were 3D glasses from a, a movie theater. But what he called his agent glasses that he started wearing. And his shirt says, they'll make a movie about me someday. And um, I don't know if that's true. Uh, but his case was featured on the, uh, the NBC Nightly News. And uh, the main events of, of this case uh, took place now eight years ago. So uh, Ryan is now 14 uh, and doing very well. He's doing very well academically and socially, and, and uh, um, things are, are going well for him. Um, so now to tell you a little bit about how this work got started. Um, Ian Stevenson uh, was a psychiatrist who came to the University of Virginia in 1957 to be the chairman of, of the Department of Psychiatry. And he was in the middle of a perfectly successful mainstream career. He was still in his late 30s when, when he was uh, asked to be chairman of the department. And when he interviewed for the job, he told people that he had an interest in parapsychology, uh, but he had a lot of other interests too, and, and nobody seemed to mind. Uh, but then after he got to UVA, he, um, he heard about these reports of, of young children remembering a past life uh, in various places, and he decided to go investigate. So he learned about five, trips in, in, uh, five cases in India, and he went to India for a month and found 25 cases. Uh, he got similar results in Sri Lanka, and he realized that this phenomenon was much more common than anyone, at least in the West, had ever known about before, uh, and got intrigued by the work um, and started spending more time on it. And, and he was able to do this because after he published his first paper on these cases, uh, someone who became interested in the work was a man named Chester Carlson. Uh, Chester Carlson invented the Xerox machine, so of course he was quite wealthy, and he started funding Ian's work uh, to the point that in 1967, Ian able, was able to step down as chairman of the department and uh, work full time on, on this kind of work and, and established what is now called the Division of Perceptual Studies, a research division within the Department of Psychiatry. Um, and uh, so Division of Perceptual Studies, or DOPS for short, and um, Ian then spent the bulk of the next 35 years uh, on these cases. Um, he, he took trips uh, to various places all over the world. Uh, this is him in Burma. And um, as you can imagine, a, an American professor shows up in an Asian village and starts asking about past life memories. Uh, tends to draw quite a crowd, uh, as it did there. Um, and went to various places, mostly in Asia, but, but other places as well. And, and he always maintained a careful, methodical approach. He never assumed that a case was due to reincarnation. Um, and uh, instead, he just wanted to determine as carefully as he could exactly what had happened in each case and what the evidence was for connection to a previous life. 
And that is certainly still the attitude that we use with this work today. So I, I may not say alleged memories or apparent memories, uh, but we certainly consider it very much an open question as, as we approach each case. Uh, so Ian wrote numerous books and papers about this phenomenon. Uh, one of his books on uh, cases in India was reviewed in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and reviewed actually by the um, a book review editor who wrote, in regard to reincarnation, he has painstakingly and unemotionally collected a detailed series of cases from India, cases in which the evidence is difficult to explain on any other grounds. He has placed on record a large amount of data that cannot be ignored. Now, the latter part of that turned out not really to be true in the sense that many people did ignore the, uh, the data that Ian was collecting, um, but that did not deter him, and he kept up with the work. Uh, he spent years working on another book that I'll tell you about in a few minutes. And he also worked to get other researchers interested in these cases. One of the early criticisms of Ian was that he was the only one finding these cases. Uh, but he got other people involved, several psychologists and then anthropologists started uh, studying these cases both with Ian but also independently. And then as a child psychiatrist, um, I got involved in, in the late 90s, uh, so I've been at it now for uh, 20 years myself. Uh, and Ian continued to work. He finally retired in 2002, at, at that point, well into his 80s. And even after he retired, he took one more trip to India. Um, his wife said at one point that she didn't mind him taking the trips, but she just wished that he would stop saying that each one was going to be his last trip. Um, and then he passed away in 2007, uh, remaining active almost until the very end. Um, the year before he died, he published his final paper, which was a wonderful review of his work called Half a Career with the Paranormal. And he finished that paper with, with these words. So his final published words were, let no one think that I know the answer, I am still seeking. Uh, which I thought was a, uh, a rather nice way to go out. And as for DOPS, uh, we are still going with, with the help of, of other donors uh, after Chester Carlson. Uh, this is our current home. Uh, we certainly don't occupy the whole building, uh, but uh, there we have the Ian Stevenson Memorial Library, uh, where we have several thousand very interesting books. Uh, we also have a neuroimaging lab there where we do things like uh, do EEG recordings while people are trying to perform ESP tests, uh, tests and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we are also continuing to work with children's past life memories, which is, is my area of interest. So to tell you more about the phenomenon, um, I mentioned that it involves very young children, and they spontaneously start talking about a past life. This work does not involve hypnotic regression, uh, but rather the kids just start coming out with, with details, typically about a recent ordinary life. Uh, they are not talking about being kings or queens, almost never talk about being a famous person. Um, but somebody ordinary, uh, usually from the same country. And when I say recent, uh, the average interval between the death of the previous person and the birth of the child is only four and a half years. Uh, now, there are certainly exceptions, like Ryan's case was, was an exception, uh, but typically they're very recent. And some of the kids talk about being a deceased family member, like a, a grandparent. Uh, but others, like Ryan, describe being a stranger in another location. And if the child gives enough details, like the name of that location, then people have often gone there and found that, in fact, somebody did live and die whose life matches the details that the child gave. Um, in that circumstance, we call it a solved case. Uh, if a child talks about a past life, but no one's able to verify that the details match somebody who actually lived, we call it unsolved. Uh, we have plenty of both kinds, actually, in our collection, but two-thirds of the ones that we've studied uh, have been solved. 
Now, the one part of the past life that is often out of the ordinary is how the previous person died. 70% uh, of the cases involve a past life that ended by unnatural means, meaning murder, suicide, combat, accident, that sort of thing. Uh, so that certainly seems to be an important part of this phenomenon. Um, so we've looked at this a little bit. So with each case, uh, we code it on 200 variables and put it into a database. Uh, and it's taking us years and years to get all the old cases coded, but we've got over 2,000 of them now coded. And one of the items that we've looked at with the database is mode of death. Um, so I'll warn you, this next graph looks a little complicated. Um, Going up and down is just the number of cases, and then going across is the age when the previous person died. Uh, the green bars at the top are the natural deaths, and then all the other colors are the various kinds of unnatural deaths that the previous people suffered. Uh, so the main point of the slide is to show you that we have a lot of unnatural deaths. Um, but it also looks like people are dying young. Uh, the, the complicated part is that people who die unnatural deaths tend to be younger um, because they're the ones that are more likely to drive too fast or to drive motorcycles or get into drunken knife fights or whatever. Uh, but what we can do is we can pull those out and look just at the natural death cases to see if dying young is an independent factor from, from dying violently. Uh, this next graph is just a, one I pulled off the internet, but it's uh, a typical graph of deaths by age. So again, going up and down is number of deaths, going across is the age when people die. And it's a typical graph where going across the lifespan, you see this gradually upsloping curve until eventually so many people have died. There's so few people left that it drops off at the end. But for most of the lifespan, you get this gradually upsloping curve. Well, with our cases, just looking at the natural death ones, uh, the curve actually goes in the other direction. And in fact, in a quarter of the cases, the previous person was age 15 or less. Uh, so there seems to be something about dying violently or dying young that makes it more likely that a child will later talk about that life. Now, as far as where we um, find the cases, we have now studied over 2,500 cases uh, worldwide. And they are easiest to find in cultures with a belief in reincarnation. So I've, I've listed the countries where we have the most cases. Um, but that's just because we've had associates looking for cases for, uh, in those places. And in fact, cases have been found wherever anyone has looked. Uh, they've been found on all the continents except Antarctica. And um, they've been found here as well. So they seem to be less common in the West, uh, but it may just be that they're harder to find here because in a lot of places, like in a lot of places in India, if a child starts talking about a past life, the family will tell people and word would spread and then eventually one of our associates would find out about it. Here, many families are embarrassed by what their children are saying, so they don't tell anyone. Uh, so the cases can be hard to find, but these days, the, the families find us. So if a child starts talking about a past life, the parents go online, they learn about us, and, and then typically they will email us. Uh, so I, I focus these days on the American cases. And what we see is that most of them come from families who did not believe in reincarnation before their child started talking about a past life. But we see that the features of the cases here are just like the ones in other places. So the American cases are proof that children having past life memories is not purely a cultural phenomenon. Uh, that was another criticism of Ian Stevenson's work, uh, that he was just finding cases in, in places where people believed in reincarnation. Uh, but in fact, there are plenty of cases here. Now, the fact that they happen here when there are no environmental factors that would encourage children to imagine a past life uh, raises at least the question, could these be due to a psychological disturbance? Uh, so we did psychological testing with a number of these children and found that uh, they are not dissociating, they are, are not showing any sort of psychological disturbance. Uh, the one thing that showed up in the testing is that the children tend to be very intelligent uh, and very verbal. Um, 
and um, otherwise uh, they seem to be just ordinary kids. Now as far as the features of the cases go, one feature that Ian found really interesting was uh, a number of the children have been born with birthmarks or birth defects that match wounds, usually the fatal wound, on the body of the previous person. And Ian had a long interest in psychosomatic medicine, the, the interplay between uh, mind and body, long before he got in this work. So these really um, fascinated him. He spent years studying these cases and then many more years uh, writing them up and eventually published a book called Reincarnation and Biology, which is a two-volume, 2,000-page book uh, of over 200 such cases. And um, I don't have time to review all 200 cases with you, uh, but I'll show you a couple of pictures. So uh, there was a girl who remembered the life of a man who got his fingers chopped off as, as he was being murdered, and the little girl was born with her hands looking like that. Um, there was a boy who remembered the life of a boy from another village who had lost the fingers of his right hand in a fodder chopping machine. And the second little boy was born with his hands uh, looking like that, which is quite an unusual defect. Uh, there was also a boy who remembered the life of a man who was killed by a shotgun blast to the side of his head. And this little boy was born with just a stub for an ear and uh, an underdeveloped right side of his face. Um, Ian also listed 18 cases in which children were born with two birthmarks, ones that matched both the entrance wound and the exit wound on, on the body of a gunshot victim. Now, as if these cases aren't strange enough, uh, there's also a phenomenon in several parts of Asia uh, that Ian called experimental birthmarks. Uh, and this is a practice where uh, after a person dies, someone will take a substance, usually soot or paste, and make a mark on the body and, and make a wish that the person carry the mark with them to their next life where they'll be born with a birthmark uh, that shows um, um, where they have come to be reborn. Uh, and this is usually done with the expectation that the person will be born into the same family. Uh, so Ian studied 20 of these cases and, and then a colleague and I found 18 more. One of the ones that we found was a, a boy in Thailand who's thought to be his grandmother. And his grandmother, before she died, said that she wanted to come back as a male uh, so that one day she could have a mistress. Um, <laughs> the way her husband did. And <clears throat> after she died, her, uh, one of her daughters took a, some white paste and just made a mark down the back of her neck. And then a year later, uh, a grandson was born and um, he had this mark on the back of his neck. He didn't talk a lot about her life, but he did make a number of statements uh, remembering being his grandmother. Um, this is another case from Thailand. Uh, this is a, a little girl whose grandfather died five years before she was born. And a couple of hours after he died, uh, her aunt took some soot from the bottom of a rice pot. And I had one of the, vill the villagers uh, put some on his finger just to show what it looked like. Uh, she took some soot from the bottom of a rice pot and made a mark on his right leg above his ankle. Uh, and then five years later, this little girl was born uh, with this mark on her right leg uh, above her ankle. Now, when we saw her, she was only two and a half, and she hadn't made any clear statements that related to the past life, but of course, she was still very young then. Uh, and then the, uh, the last case of this type that I want to tell you about is one of Ian's cases from Burma. Uh, this young woman, unfortunately, was the previous person in this case. Uh, she was born with a uh, congenital heart defect and then died uh, when she was 20 during open heart surgery. And after she died, three of her friends offered to prepare the body for cremation. And they'd heard about bodies being marked, so they took some red lipstick and, and made markings on, on the back of her neck. And then a year later, her older sister was born. 
and I mean her older sister uh, gave birth to a girl uh, who was born uh, with this birthmark if, if you can see it's a red area on the back of her neck now as Ian pointed out the women picked the worst possible place to mark a body because stork bite birthmarks are pretty common and will occasionally persist in, into early childhood um, but when Ian studied this case he also noticed that this little girl and I don't know how well it projects but uh, she had this white line uh, going from mid sternum to mid abdomen that looked similar to a cardiac surgery scar uh, except it was older at least by the time that that he met the girl when she was four years old uh, and she had talked about the past life in fact she had asked to be called by the previous person's name and she would refer to the family members uh, by the relationship that the previous woman had so for instance she called her own mother uh, the the um, uh, term for uh, older sister um, and when Ian studied the case he interviewed the women who had marked the body and discovered that one of them had never met this little girl so unannounced he took the woman to the family's home they walked in and he said to the little girl who is this and she immediately said mint mint ooh which in fact was the name of the woman who had uh, marked the body now, along with these birthmarks, of course, are the statements that the children uh, make about the past life. And I said it was young children, the, the average age when a child starts talking about a past life is 35 months. So it's usually a two or three year old who starts coming out with these things. And some of them will do it in sort of a detached way, but many of them show very strong emotional involvement with this material. Um, and they, uh, as Ryan did, they'll beg and cry to be taken to the previous family. Um, some of them will show a lot of anger, especially if the previous person is killed. Uh, so there's one case I saw in Thailand where the previous person was a young man who had um, been killed by a friend of his in a hunting accident and then a few years later this little boy was uh, born in the same village and, and remembered his life and, and when he was two tried to choke the, the fellow who had accidentally uh, killed the previous person uh, and it seems that in the stronger cases the children do show more emotion as, as they're talking about the past life uh, but even so, kids will often talk about these things with great intensity one minute and then just run off and play the next. Um, some of the kids have access to this material at all times, but, but for others, they have to be in the right frame of mind. And it's usually during relaxed times. So like after a bath or during a long car ride, the, the kids will start talking about these things. Um, and then by the time they're six or seven, they will typically stop talking about the past life and then just go on with their lives. Um, most of them seem to lose the memories, um, but there are definitely some who, um, even as adults, say they still have some memories, but uh, that they, they just stop talking about them anyway and, and sort of got on with their lives. Now, as far as what they say about the past life, um, they don't tend to come out with enlightened words of wisdom. Uh, instead, what they do is focus on the end of the life. So 75% of them uh, will describe remembering how they died in the last life. And they will also talk about people from the end of the life. So it's as if the memory has just picked up where it left off at, at the end of the last life. And then about 20% of them will talk about memories of events between lives uh, after the previous person died but before they were born. Um, some of them will describe um, staying near where the previous person died or near the previous family. Uh, some of them will talk about the funeral that the previous person had. Uh, there was one little girl in Thailand who made a lot of statements about a past life but one of the things that she complained about was that she had wanted her ashes buried but instead they were scattered. Uh, and what happened, the, the previous woman had wanted her ashes buried under the bow tree of the temple complex where she studied. But when her daughter went to bury them, the root system of the tree was, was so extensive that she couldn't bury them, so she scattered them instead. Um, and then some of the kids will talk about going to other realms uh, like heaven. In fact, some of the American kids will use the word heaven. Uh, and then some talk about either choosing their next parents or being led to their next parents to, and then starting a new life. 
Um, also, some of the cases, some of the statements involve recognitions or identifications of people or, or places from uh, the past life, and, and I want to uh, tell you about a couple of those cases. Um, <clears throat> one's a little boy named Sam Taylor, who was born 18 months after his paternal grandfather died. And then one day, uh, Sam's father was changing his diaper, and Sam looked up at him and said, when I was your age, I used to change your diapers. <laughs> and his parents thought that was quite odd, uh, needless to say. Uh, they had never given reincarnation a second thought. In fact, uh, Sam's mother was the daughter of a Southern Baptist missionary. But he kept talking like that. He kept saying, I used to be grandpa, and I used to be big. So his um, mother in particular became intrigued by this. So she would ask him questions. And, and when she asked him about siblings, he said how he'd had a, a sister, uh, but she had been murdered and turned into a fish. And it turned out that the grandfather had a sister who, in fact, had been murdered some 60 years before, and then her uh, body had been dumped in the bay. And Sam's parents felt certain that he had never heard about her. Um, he also talked about how at the end of his life, his wife would always make milkshakes for him. And not just that she made milkshakes, but that she made them uh, in a food processor rather than a blender, uh, which in fact was true for, for Sam's grandparents. Uh, and then when he was four and a half, his uh, grandmother died, and his father went out to take care of her belongings, uh, came back with some family photos, which they had not ha had before. And uh, Sam's mom, one evening, had them spread out on the coffee table looking at them. And Sam walked over and started seeing pictures of his grandfather and pointing to those and saying, hey, that's me, that's me. Um, so to test him, his mom showed him this class picture and said, okay, show us who you are. And he ran his finger along the different faces and then stopped at the one of his grandfather and said, that's me. Now, this is what we call a uh, same family case, um, meaning that, that Sam was remembering a deceased family member. And of course, with a case like this, we never know for sure whether he might have learned the details of, of the previous person uh, just ordinarily by, by hearing about them. Uh, but with this next case I'm going to tell you about, that is certainly not a possibility. Uh, this is one of a... Uh, very recent, when I studied a few months ago, a little boy who uh, seemed to remember life in uh, uh, ending in the Vietnam War. So it's a little five-year-old boy named Stephen, and he asked his parents one day if they remembered when uh, he was in the war. And he said how he was in the army, and he talked about uh, being uh, in the jungle, but also uh, being on the beach. And he said that it was 1969, so his parents asked him, well, was this Vietnam? And, and he said yes and, and gave other details like talking about guns and trenches and so forth. Uh, and he said that he died when he was 21. And he also gave uh, his last name. Uh, and it was an unusual name. Uh, and then he, his parents asked him where he was from and he gave uh, the name of a state. So his mother went online and, and found the uh, Vietnam Memorial website and was shocked to see that, in fact, there was somebody with this unusual last name from the state that Stephen had named who was killed in Vietnam when he was 21. Um, so she showed him the pictures of various um, um, soldiers who had been killed uh, on the Vietnam Memorial website, and when she got to the one of, of this guy, the guy with the name uh, that the student had given, he said, oh, that's me. Uh, so then she didn't do any more online searching, and, and instead uh, she wrote to me, told me about the case, so then I did some more searching. I, I uh, joined a uh, newspaper archive website, so I was able to access uh, the previous fellow's uh, obituary, and then followed that to learn various details, uh, including his home address where he lived, as well as the high school that he went to. Uh, so when I visited Stephen's family, I brought along some pictures to test him. 
And what I did, I didn't want to overwhelm him with tons of pictures, so what I did, I would show him pairs of pictures and asked him if he remembered either one. So the previous man went to um, Central High School. Uh, so what I did was show Stephen t pictures of two Central High Schools. And um, he pointed to the second one and, and said that he had, had been to that one, which in fact was the correct high school. Um, I also showed him pictures of, of the previous person's house along with another control picture. Um, and he said he didn't remember either one. But of course, I don't know how the house might have changed over 50 years. Um, but I also showed him pictures of, of um, to other houses, including the house across the street from the house where the man had lived, along with a control picture actually from, from Charlottesville. And he correctly pointed to the one, the top one, uh, from across the street and said he remembered that one. Then after I visited them, I, I came back and continued to do online searching, and it's frankly amazing what you can find sometimes online. So by being a member of classmates.com, uh, I was actually able to access this guy's high school yearbook from the year that he graduated from high school in, in 1968. Um, so I took pages from that yearbook and sent them along with pages from another 1968 yearbook of a different high school. Uh, I sent them by email to have his mom test Stephen to see if he could pick up the correct one out of pairs again. And the good part about these tests was Stephen's mom didn't know which was the correct one either. So there was no chance that he was somehow picking up on any cues from her about what was the right picture. And these may not project very well, but um, I showed him pages from the, of the administration of, of the um, high school principal and, and other people, uh, again, both from this man's high school and also a, a another similarly sized 1968 high school. Uh, so the principal, as well as pictures of students, uh, not from a page that included the previous person, but from another page, um, as well as pictures of teachers. And uh, Stephen uh, got the right answer on all of those. And when I told his mother that, she wrote back and said, oh, wow, that is crazy. He was so casual about it. Um, so then I wrote to the previous person's sister, and um, her daughter sent me some family photos. Uh, so I showed him two pictures, and one of them was the previous person's father, which Stephen again pointed out. Um, I tried pictures of the mothers, but I didn't have a great picture of the previous person's mother, and he didn't recognize any, uh, either one of those, and, and then said he was tired of looking at pictures. Um, but for the pairs where he did make a, uh, a pick, he was six out of six. So that would be like trying to flip a coin six times and getting head every, heads every time. Uh, so the odds against chance of doing that is one out of 64. Uh, so less than a 2% chance that, that you could do it uh, just by luck, pick the correct one each time. Uh, so these are um, evidence that Stephen did have a link uh, to uh, this young man who uh, lost his life in, in Vietnam. Now, along with the statements, um, the children also often show behaviors that seem linked to the past life. So I've mentioned that a lot of them show emotions. And they will show emotions toward the individual members of the previous family, if they meet the previous family, uh, that are appropriate for the relationship that the previous person had. So uh, for instance, when a little girl meets the previous family, uh, she may be very um, deferential toward the previous husband or the uh, previous parents, uh, but very bossy toward the younger siblings, even though those younger siblings are much older than the girl is. Um, these emotions will usually fade as the kids get older, but not always. And there was at least one case where the little boy eventually grew up and married the widow of the previous person. Um, and uh, as far as phobias go, so in the unnatural death cases, over 35% of the children will show an intense fear toward the mode of death uh, from the previous life. So for instance, there was a little girl who, from the time she was born, basically, she hated being in water. And it would take three adults to hold her down to give her a bath when she was an infant. And then when she got old enough to talk, uh, described a, a life of a girl in another village who had drowned in an accident. Um, 
Likes and dislikes. So the most obvious examples with foods is uh, Ian studied a couple of dozen cases in Burma of children who said that they'd been Japanese soldiers who were killed in Burma during World War II. And many of them would complain about the spicy Burmese food and ask to eat raw fish instead. Uh, and addictive substances, uh, this picture, which is a a uh, young child smoking a cigarette. Um, this is not from one of our cases, uh, but it could be, because unfortunately it seems that addictive substances can sometimes continue their allure even across lifetimes. So if the previous person was a big smoker or drinker, uh, then the little kids sometimes will try to sneak cigarettes or even uh, sneak alcohol. Uh, and then themes in the play. So, uh, a lot of these kids will act out in particular the occupation that the previous person had. Uh, so for instance, there was one little boy who would play compulsively for hours on end at being a biscuit shopkeeper, which is what the previous person did. And he would refuse to do anything else, uh, including schoolwork. And he uh, fell behind in school and, and his mother felt like he was really never able to catch up because of it. Uh, and then gender nonconformity. So, uh, in the general population, most kids from a very early age will uh, show gender typical behavior. So like girls playing with dolls and, and boys playing with cars or trucks. And, and of course there's a lot of debate about what leads to that. But, but most kids will show gender typical behavior. Um, but about... Um, 3% of girls and 5%, no, 5, 3% uh, of boys and 5% of girls will show what's called gender nonconformity, where they do the behaviors that are more typical of, of their natal sex, the sex that they're born with. Um, in our cases of children who remember a past life as a member of the opposite sex, 80% of them will show gender nonconformity. And that will sometimes persist even to adulthood. Uh, but most of these behaviors uh, will fade as the kids grow older and, and then they just live perfectly ordinary lives. Um, but these behaviors show that it's not just information that seems to have carried over, but it seems that emotions uh, and, and feelings can survive as well and, and then show up in, in another life. Um, so I want to finish up by uh, telling you about a case that has some pretty prominent behaviors in it. Uh, this is a case that, that got a fair amount of press. It's a little boy named James Leininger. And um, it was on TV some, and his parents eventually wrote a book about their uh, experiences. Um, he's a boy who talked about being a uh, pilot who was killed during World War II. And it is uh, now believed that that pilot has been identified. So his parents are this Christian couple in Louisiana. And his uh, father in particular was quite opposed to the idea of past lives before his son uh, started remembering one. So the, the case began when James was 22 months old and his father took him to a flight museum. And James was fascinated by the World War II exhibit where he kept wanting to go back and see those planes uh, to the point that he and his dad ended up spending three hours in the museum. Uh, and then a couple of months later, James started having terrible nightmares multiple times a week in which he would be kicking his legs up in the air and screaming, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. Uh, and after I spent a weekend talking with, with James and his parents, um, I also talked with James's aunt who had spent a lot of time with the family. She said, you cannot believe how disturbing these nightmares were to witness, that it really looked like somebody fighting for his life. And then during the day, James would take his little toy airplanes and he would say, airplane crash on fire, and bam, he would slam them nose first into the coffee table. And his parents are apparently quite tolerant people um, because their coffee table, I don't know how well this projects, but there are dozens of scratches and dents from airplane crash on fire, bam. So that looks like what we call post-traumatic play. And when you combine it with James's nightmares, he really looked like a traumatized child, um, but he had not been through any trauma, uh, at least in, in this life. And then his parents were able to have several conversations with him about this material uh, while he was awake. Uh, and this was all when he was two years old. 
So he said how his plane had crashed on fire, how it had been shot down by the Japanese, and he said that he flew a Corsair. No, I'd never heard of a Corsair, um, but it was a special plane that's developed during World War II. Um, and after this case got some uh, publicity, skeptics said, well, James had just seen a Corsair at the Flight Museum and the name stuck with him. And in fact, if you go to the website of the Flight Museum, you see that in fact they do have a Corsair there. Um, but James's dad said that there was not one there when he and James visited. So I looked into it and found that his dad was right. The museum had had a Corsair, but it had crashed at a public air show the year before. And they didn't get a replacement until three years afterwards. Uh, so that's not where uh, James learned about a Corsair. He also said that he flew off of a boat. And his parents asked him the name of the boat. And he said, Natoma. Now, I think if uh, you're going to try to guess the name of a U.S. aircraft carrier, not many of us would say Natoma. And in fact, his dad responded, well, that sounds Japanese to me. And James said, uh, no, it was American. Um, so <laughs> after that conversation, uh, James's dad went online, and he eventually found this material on the USS Natoma Bay. And he printed out the material, so the footer, if you can see it, is, gives the date when he printed it out, which is 8-27-2000. So this documents, uh, James was born in April 1998. So this documents that by the time he was 28 months old, that Natoma was part of the story. And uh, the USS Natoma Bay was, in fact, it was a escort carrier that was stationed in the Pacific during World War II. Now, James's parents also asked him who he was then, and he always just said me or James, which they didn't make anything of. Um, and they also asked him one time who else was there, and he said Jack, Jack Larson. So this was all when he was two. And then when he was two and a half, his father bought this uh, book on Iwo Jima to give to his father, James's grandfather. And he was looking through it one day when James came and got in his lap. And they got to this page that showed a picture of Iwo Jima. And James pointed at the picture and said, that's where my plane was shot down. And his dad said, what? And he said, my airplane got shot down there, Daddy. And that just floored James's dad that his two and a half year old was talking like this. And then he learned that the Natoma Bay did, in fact, take uh, uh, part in the Iwo Jima operation. Then when James got old enough to draw, he drew dozens and dozens of pictures of planes, and he always signed them James III. Now, I thought that might be because he was three years old when he drew them, but his parents said no. They asked him about it, and he said, I'm the third James. I'm James III. And in fact, he continued to uh, sign them that way even after he turned four. Um, and his dad pointed out, and I kind of agree, that all those dots that he drew on there look like incoming flak that, that a uh, pilot would see uh, flying the plane. So with all this going on, uh, James's parents did eventually begin to wonder if he was, in fact, remembering a past life. So when he was four and a half, uh, James's dad uh, went to a Natoma Bay reunion. And he learned that, in fact, there was a Jack Larson who had been on the ship. Uh, he was looking for Jack Larsons among the war dead. But this Jack Larson had survived the war and was even still alive. Uh, so James's dad went and, and met with him and learned that he was on the ship during the Iwo Jima operation. And he also learned that there was one and only one pilot from the ship uh, that was killed during the Iwo Jima operation. This was a young man from Pennsylvania named James Houston. So that means if James Leininger was remembering a past life, it had to be Houston's life because he was the only pilot from the ship who was killed there. Uh, so what we can do is compare James's statements with Houston's life. Now, James's parents said that he also talked about family life before the war. Um, but we don't have documentation of those statements that was made before Houston was identified. Uh, but what I've done is, is listed all the items where we do have definite documentation that was made before anyone knew anything about uh, James Houston.
So uh, James signed his drawings, James three. James Houston was James Jr., which would make James Leininger the third James. James said he flew off the Natoma. Houston was a pilot on the USS Natoma Bay. James said he flew a Corsair. Houston had flown a Corsair. He was actually flying a different plane when he was killed, but he was part of the squadron that tested the Corsair for the Navy. James said he was shot down by the Japanese. Houston was shot down by the Japanese. James said he died at Iwo Jima. Houston was the one and only Natoma Bay pilot who was killed during the Iwo Jima operation. James said one day, quote, my airplane got shot in the engine and crashed in the water and that's how I died. Eyewitnesses reported that Houston's plane was, quote, hit head on right on the middle of the engine. James had nightmares of a plane crashing and sinking in the water. Houston's plane crashed in the water and quickly sank. And James said that Jack Larson was there, and Jack Larson was pilot of the plane next to Houston's on the day that he was killed. So with that, I will stop. Um, if you want to learn more about our work, please go to our website, which is uvadops.org. Um, I am also happy to take questions now, and, and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much. So raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone. Please stand up to ask your question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. Of course. Um, have you ever heard of a little girl saying to her daddy when she was three, Daddy, do you remember when we were married? Um, yes, I, we have heard from parents that where the child has said that sort of thing. Um, now, most of the kids do not describe a connection with someone in their current life in the past life, but some of them do. So yeah, that's the kind of thing that we've heard. So this is probably asking your opinion uh, versus science. Sure. Do you believe that all of us have had former lives, we just don't remember them. Well, that's a good question, and I agree with your premise. I mean, our cases actually don't say whether this is universal or whether it's just these kids. Uh, the question is whether, I mean, the, the type of death seems to be a factor here, but is it just that um, uh, dying violently or dying young then makes it um, more likely that you come back quickly with intact memories or whether you come back here at all. Uh, my own personal opinion is that uh, while we all, I think, um, have had an existence before, we wouldn't necessarily have had an existence in this reality. So I, I personally don't believe that we've all had past lives here, but I could be completely wrong about that. So I actually, um, whoops, for memory purposes, had to write a few down. Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to know if you had associations with the many ghost stories many of us have. And part of a ghost story does tie in with like violent deaths, sort of more the propensity to, quote, come back as you know, some spiritual thing. Um, that was one question. Uh, our son at age two d didn't talk about past life or anything, but it was very unusual because he would get up at, at um, late night, we'd be listening to music, and he would come out, like sleepwalking, climb up on a coffee table, and back to us, and just, you know, perk up, and then do these dance moves that were very sophisticated, mm -hmm. not, not dancing around, but, you know, he looked like a little Barishnikov, and, um, and later he, he was like the one male dancer all through school, mm -hmm. and, and probably got recruited, um, and, he's a, and he's very mathematical. I didn't know if, if there were any traits or propensities that show up in the kids. Okay. So that was just another question, and then, um, and then I guess they age out of their memories, which is what you said. Yeah. And I used to joke all the time, it's like, well, this kid, because they all show their own, you know, well, this kid was a French truck driver, because he, you know, loved long-legged brunettes and hoes, yeah. but, you know, different, different traits for each kid, but nobody was royalty. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um, so, to answer the first question as far as hauntings, uh, that's not something that we study, um, but there are 
careful studies that have been done with some of those, the person who I'm most familiar with, uh, there's an investigator named Lloyd Auerbach who has tried to study uh, alleged hauntings uh, the same way that we take a careful approach to these cases. Um, as far as what you're describing with your son, um, certainly we see in our cases what Ian Stevenson called behavioral memories and you know, it's possible, it's plausible that his child could have behavioral memories but not have verbal memories. So it's sort of remembering the dance moves uh, but not remember other details from the life. Um, and we do have, some of the children will have sort of um, um, special talents uh, that seem connected to the past life. And we don't have a ton of those, uh, but there's one in, in one of my books, a, a, a long story that I won't go into, but a young child who said he remembered being the, the golfer Bobby Jones, who was a golfer a long time ago now. Uh, but this kid was a real golfing prodigy, uh, and it's won dozens of golf tournaments at, at an early age. So we do see those behavioral skills in some of our lives, uh, some of our cases. Good evening. Hi. Um, you mentioned a lot of the children um, refer to heaven, which we equate with a belief in a higher power. H uh, how would you, I mean, do you find that, that it's in religious families or children raised with some sort of belief in a higher power that that resonates, or is it across the board? Well, the terminology differs from uh, depending on where kids are. But there are certainly plenty of kids in Asia who will talk about going to another room, meeting spiritual guides, and that sort of thing. They don't necessarily use the word heaven. But um, we've looked at these reports, and what's most striking is the similarity of a lot of them to the near-death experience reports that people talk about when they come near death or, or die and then are revived. Uh, so there, there is this sort of um, higher power or spiritual kind of component to a lot of these reports that, that um, does seem to happen anywhere. Uh, do the memories, can the memories just happen once or twice? His, uh, my son, um, I was once reading him a book about Jackie Robinson and in the book they went to a jazz club in Harlem and my son goes, I used to do that. And I said, no, you, you want to do that? And he said, no, I used to do that. And then he, now he's a professional trumpet player. <laughs> and it always was, uh, and, but he never mentioned it. He didn't tell me anything else, but I just vividly remember that one time and he said, I used to do that. Yeah. And I don't know if that. Yeah, we, we do get those cases. There's one actually in Charlottesville where the, uh, um, woman I was driving down the road one day with her kid in the back seat and he certainly pipes up and says, in my last life I drove a big truck. And that was the only thing he ever said about it. Um, and then there's another one where a little girl had a very intensely emotional memory just one time for like an hour and, and that was it. So yeah, there, you know, with all of these, it's sort of like in many cases seems to be, you've got some glimpses of a dream where you don't fully remember it, but you'll remember pieces of it, and, and sometimes it's just a quick glimpse, and, and then that's all there is. Thank you for your presentation. Um, when you were looking at the development of the brain of the child, and you had the differentiation between two-year-old and then the eight-year-old, is there an openness of the brain of the two-year-old that is different than the eight-year-old that allows for this open corridor? Thank you. Well, certainly the brain um, around the age of five or six goes, it undergoes tremendous physical changes and um, with, with a lot of um, new nerve cells being uh, built and so forth. And that's actually the age where all young children lose their memories of early childhood. Um, so even memories that are fully in long-term memory, um, by the time they're six or seven, they'll typically forget. And it's the same with most of our cases, they lose those memories. Um, but also for people who have been parents, you probably know, young children often seem to have sort of a connection to um, otherworldliness that the rest of us don't have. They may talk about heaven or talk about seeing angels or seeing deceased relatives and, and then that typically fades away and they get more 
grounded in this life and, and hopefully you know enjoy it and maybe maybe we need to let those things go so that we can fully experience this life here thank you for the work you're doing this is very important stuff we really Thanks. appreciate you sharing it with us do you ever hear reports of children remembering lives on other planets or as other uh, beings aside from human uh, yeah, with the other planets, I mean, once in a blue moon we'll get those reports, and, and so to speak. Um, and uh, needless to say, they're completely unverifiable. Um, but we don't hear many of those. I think for intact memories to come through, it's much more likely if it is a closely connected life. So they're usually very recent. They're usually from fairly close by, and sometimes even in the same family. So. Uh, it's not to say that other people don't have other kinds of lives, but just the memories aren't able to make it through that, that long process. Um, as far as other beings, other animals, uh, we do occasionally get those reports. And, um, you know, those aren't ones that are necessarily completely comfortable to hear about. And again, they're usually <coughs> very unverifiable. Uh, there was one case with a, a kid remembering the life of a snake, which is, um, again, I put in one of my books, and it's, it's a pretty wild case, but the, the wildest part, perhaps, and it was even, there were verifiable details about remembering being killed by a particular man in a cave, and, and that stuff was verified, uh, but the boy was born with what's called ichthyosis, where he had scaly skin, um, so that, that was quite an interesting case. <laughs> A, a question about your work. Yes. Are there also other agencies or departments in academia, in psychiatry or elsewhere, that also seek reports like this, or are the targets of reports like this, or are you like the tornado chaser? Um, well, we're the only depart or division, research division that seeks these, uh, but th as I mentioned, Ian Stevenson got other um, investigators, other researchers involved where they will do it at other universities, but not as part of a, a research division, but just do it on their own. Any um, relationship between imaginary friends and past life um, things you're describing? Well, that's an interesting question. Actually, one of our colleagues, uh, an anthropologist, wrote a paper comparing the two. And, you know, there's some similarities, and then there are also a lot of differences. And, and um, I confess we don't really ask, uh, or at least I haven't asked with the families I've interviewed, whether these kids also talk about imaginary friends. It's, it's not something that they've reported spontaneously. I, I can't think of a single case, actually, where a child talked about an imaginary friend. Um, but, but there probably are some. But the, we're not aware of a connection. Have there been any cases um, where they speak a different language? Or, or? Yeah, that, that's what's called xenoglossy. There, there are a very small number, and none of them is, is a perfect case, I'll say that. Uh, now, most of the kids are talking about a past life in the same country, so they speak the same language. Uh, there have been some where the parents said that they spoke a language, or seemed to be speaking a language that no one understood when they were younger. And the child did then talk about a past life in another country. Um, but. What's more likely is that the parents will say that the child uh, was able to learn another language much quicker than his or her peers were, but not that, that they just came out with it. Have you done any research on um, the neuropsychiatry or the neurophysiology of the brain in terms of any differences? I'm thinking also about studies that were done, I think it was Prebrum, during split brain surgery where they would stimulate with an electrode a certain part of the brain and because the person's awake, they were able to trigger a memory and sometimes it was a memory of essentially a past life or a second language that that person didn't know or something such as that. Well, needless to say, that's one study we haven't done, is to uh, poke the brains of, of these kids. Um, it, it's, we have not done formal neuropsychological testing um, in any more depth than what I described. I and mean, we, we did do some, not neuropsych testing of the brain, but more psychological functioning. Um, 
As far as functional imaging of the brain, I mean, that would be almost impossible to do in three or four year olds. Uh, there may be testing that we can do later, but we have not done it so far. Are you taking new cases? And if you do, who are we contact to? Uh, we are taking new cases, and um, you can reach me or reach us. Uh, well, it just went off, but the uh, UVA DOPS, D O P S dot org, or if you just Google my name, um, you can email me, and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to read about the case. Can you share any cases where they talked about picking their parents from heaven or wherever they were? Uh, well, one was actually. Um, James Leininger was one, and uh, he said one day that he was glad that he had, he told his dad he was glad that he had picked him to be his father, and he said that he had done it uh, when he saw his parents having dinner on the beach at a pink hotel in Hawaii, <laughs> and it turned out that in fact his parents had gone to Hawaii, stayed at a pink hotel, and the last night of the trip had uh, dinner on the beach. And it was during that trip that his parents started trying to conceive. Um, the mom didn't actually get pregnant for a couple of months, but that was when the intention began. Um, and then Ryan, the case I showed you at first, he, he didn't say that he picked his parents, but he told his mother about um, how she had wanted to have a girl and how upset she had gotten when the doctor did a test and told her that she was having a boy and how she had gone to dinner with her husband and cried through the whole thing. And that in fact did happen because um, Ryan's dad had been married before and was a little bit older. So when they got married, he had kids from his previous marriage. The agreement was that they would only have one child. Ryan's mother very much wanted a little girl. So when they did the ultrasound, she cried at dinner with her, her husband. And of course, she was also always very ashamed of how she had behaved. So there's, I mean, there's no chance that she told Ryan that story, but then he, t <laughs> he told it to her. Uh, but she was eventually glad that she'd had him as, uh, as her child. Do you think the past life phenomena may be an explanation for uh, split personality or multiple personality disorder? Um, probably not, but that's a very, compli very complicated area in psychiatry. Um, uh, which is sort of the subject of another talk, but um, I mean, even in those cases, the as far as the ones I know of, the alter, the other personality, does not say that they lived before, but more that they're living currently. Um, so uh, I, I, the short answer is no, I don't think so. What do you feel the similarities or differences are between people, the children that come out with this spontaneously and people who go through past life regression with hypnosis? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, to, to be honest, we are fairly skeptical of hypnotic regression. Um, Mainly because hypnosis is actually a very unreliable tool for getting memories, even of this life. So sometimes it's amazingly accurate. So you know people are remembering license plate numbers from a crime scene, but other times the mind just kind of fills in the blanks, and, and then it's very hard for people to tell if it was an actual memory or, or a fantasy. Um, so when you're talking about usually unverifiable past lives from the Middle Ages or whatever, it, it it's hard to verify. Um, many of the cases show sort of historical absurdities in the people's reports. All that being said, there are a small number of cases where the people have come out with a lot of information that seems extremely unlikely they could have known through normal means. So for the most part, we're skeptical, but there are exceptions that are impressive. Now, to actually answer your question, um, as far as similarities with these kids, um, I'm not sure that there really are any similarity, uh, similarities, except many of the people in hypnotic regression do talk about remembering dying from the past life, and often that can be difficult. So it, it may be that that's part of sort of what they're working on, just as, as these kids will describe a traumatic death also. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm just wondering, 
do you have research or what is your opinion on children who come in with birth defects? If they, ch why they have chosen to come in with that or do you believe that they choose that or like what's your opinion? Well, I mean to be honest, I don't know that my opinion is worth any more than anyone else's on, on a question like that. I, I think um, from a sort of consciousness spiritual piece of it, there may be, there are certainly opportunity, you know, with every challenge there's an opportunity and, and people can uh, learn from a life with a defect, but boy, it's a tough way to learn lessons and, and perhaps there are individuals who choose to have a rough course through life or, you know, sometimes it may just be physical and not be a consciousness part at all and there may be other cases where there is this consciousness component like in the cases I showed you uh, that, that lead to defects so it may be a mixture of things. You mentioned cremation a few times and uh -huh. then Jack the Third's plane being on fire was burial a similarity between the past life? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what your question is. Were the past people all cremated? Uh, or uh, was there a difference in the burials of the past life? No, I mean, it's all just uh, sort of local custom. So in, in many of the Asian communities, the people were cremated. But of course here, most people are buried. But I mean, there are certainly exceptions. But we have not seen any factor with, with that. Yes, good evening. Hi. Does your work include any way of differentiating between a child remembering their own past life and a spirit possession which takes on and over the child and the child acts on behalf of that spirit and the spirit is not released until it is recognized and properly recognized and put to rest? Well, I think, I mean, that's an idea that certainly some people have proposed. Uh, I think the birthmarks and birth defects you know, would get to be a little bit of a stretch. Uh, but also that's certainly counter to the experience of the children. I mean, they are not just um, remembering information to be sure, but experiences from the point of view of this one person. And I mean, yes, you could say, well, it's a spirit sort of on top of a different uh, individual. Um, I, I wouldn't say that there's any evidence for that. Um, and again, the memories do tend to fade, um, but they fade along with memories of early childhood. Um, I will say also that, I mean, while the, the children um, don't necessarily talk about the past life at all times, it's not like they sort of an on-off switch where they assume a different personality and talk these things. It's a little child talking about things they say they remember. So it seems to be the same personality. So how, how does your work reconcile or follow um, the beliefs about reincarnation sort of stepping up in levels uh, with these kids? And um, additionally, have you followed any that might have gone two steps up. I know there was the Jack the third or John the third, but. Well, when you say two steps up, what, what do you well, mean? I don't know, I'm just like, well, died, you know, found the spirit. I just didn't know if you went three, three times around, you know. <laughs> well, Who knows? There, I mean, there are occasionally I think I, kids that will talk Some about people it. believe that every time you come back, you come back at a higher level. That yeah. That was the first question, okay. basic belief of reincarnation in those cultures. Yeah. So, you know, how have you reconciled it or followed that or the, you know, just well, get, yeah, I mean, it, I guess it depends what you mean by levels, but frankly, we haven't seen any patterns uh, as far as that goes. Now, we're typically only talking about two lives. Uh, occasionally, kids would remember more than one, uh, but usually it's just one life and then the next, and, and we don't, I mean, it's not like they're, if they led a good life in the past, then they're wealthier or more, uh, some of them will be more religious if the previous person was religious, but uh, it would be a hard pattern to discern in our cases anyway, but, but we don't particularly see a move up on in levels. Um, I just want to know if um, from your research, if it's changed your beliefs, what conclusions that you have? 
Well, certainly being involved in this work, which has now been 20 years, uh, I've certainly become more convinced that there is more than just this physical reality. Uh, I, um, yeah, I wasn't expecting that to be applause line, but I'll, I'm happy with it. Um, I think there is this realm of consciousness that should that exist separately and should be considered separately from just this physical world. Um, how it looks or how it works, you know, I'm still not sure. Again, as, as someone else says, I don't know if we all reincarnate here. Um, I, we do seem to have a series of existences, um, but they may be in very different realities from here. But um, but this work, I I would say is kind of affirming in, in the sense that, again, it, it provides evidence that this, there is more than just a random universe where we're here for a while and then we die. That, that there's more to it than that. How long do you generally follow these children? Uh, I know they have these memories and then you're doing your research and it yeah. takes quite a while to do that. I'm just curious to know how long you follow them. Well, it varies. Um, uh, Ian Stevenson would sometimes visit people 20 years later. Uh, I've kept in touch periodically with, well, with both uh, James Langer's father, but also Ryan's his mom. And he's now 14. And we're actually going to be uh, getting together soon. That There's a Netflix series about survival that is getting ready to be made. And one of the cases they're going to feature is Ryan's case. And, and so I'm going to get a chance to see him again. And, and also we're going to, it looks like, have him uh, meet Marty Martin's daughter again to, to have another meeting. So that should be interesting. So kind of off of what she was asking, I think, too, um, said that they kind of go from birth to eight. Do you kind of try to look at this for a longer period before you start looking into this? And how do you maintain the objectivity of it being a true science? Well, what we try to do is, as soon as we can, document exactly what the child has said. Um, and then, in, in some cases, like Ryan's, then we try to see was there somebody who, whose life he's describing. Um, but the documentation is key. We, we don't want to rely on anyone's memory if we don't have to. Now, a lot of the cases that Ian studied in Asia, the families went and found the previous person themselves before anyone wrote anything down. Um, and, and, you know, if you've got a lot of witnesses, and I mean, there can be other kinds of evidence, but we certainly prefer the evidence to be as objective as possible. Does there seem to be a connection um, with uh, reincarnation and, and the, the being um, having unfinished business where they have to um, tie up some loose ends or something through another person? Yeah, I mean, you can often make that case. The problem is, of course, that's a fairly general idea. So, but certainly if people die suddenly, die violently, or die young, I mean, you can well imagine that there would be unfinished business. Um, even in the case of Sam Taylor, who was a grandfather who just died a natural death, um, Sam's dad said that the grandfather uh, was never really able to express love to his children. So he felt like if, if Sam was his, his father reborn, that it was so that he could come back. And, and they shared a very close connection. So you know, perhaps it was some of that unfinished business that brought him back. So you were explaining how traumatic deaths are fairly important in these cases. So have you ever had a case where a murder was solved from these future children? Um, not that I'm aware of, but there are, there have occasionally been news reports of um, when these children like testifying in court. Um, but I, I, I don't, I don't know the details of those, and, and I'm not aware of, of, I mean it would make a great TV show, but I, I'm not aware of any cases like that. <laughs>